Islam on the matter, he said, show me the footnotes. That's what he asked for. So yes, scholarly work is very important, and so is grassroots backed up by that work. Talib? <clears throat> that I'm grateful for this conversation. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to be a Muslim. Um, I'm proud to be African-American, as you can probably tell. And uh, I'm also a veteran, as well as um, a uh, health care and disabilities uh, attorney. And it just always uh, surprises me. And you asked, um, and, and whether or not, I, I'm asking you, do you think that maybe we could change the narrative by making sure that um, our spokespeople uh, are also representative of the full diversity of the Muslim community. Uh, there are many other uh, African Americans, even Latino and, his, uh, and European Americans, who, as you know, are the r most uh, increasing uh, population of Muslims in this country, uh, who are more than committed to, to be involved in this conversation. So that's my first question. And my second question is, um, don't you believe that we should take um, – you know, the, the history note from the African-American experience in particular and see, for example, when we had the, um, the reconstruction of the United States uh, after the Civil War, that there was a rise in, in uh, an anti-African-American uh, sentiment uh, that basically resulted in lynching and all types of horrible actions across this country. And so do we not see the same parallel? I mean, just some months ago, all attention was on Arizona and the, uh, the laws there to demonize Latinos. And, uh, and not so long ago, it was on an, another group of uh, Americans. And so don't we think that you know, groups such as the Koch brothers, who are funding some of these things, uh, we, as we read in the New Yorker magazine, uh, some of this anti-Islamic rhetoric, don't, don't we see that there are really entrenched interests, as was said uh, right. earlier, be it financial and others, <laughs> to, to really get guys behind this? Let me yeah, just, yeah. just adjust your terminology a little bit, uh, as opposed to seeing a parallel. The way we see it, and we teach it in my organization, is that there is a continuity from the early days till now, because a lot of these African Americans were Muslims. And we believe that American Muslims from the 16th uh, century and, and later have helped build this country. We, we are not new immigrants, because if you speak about new immigrants, you're forgetting the other wing of uh, Muslims who are the natives in this country. So not only uh, do we see a continuity, but that experience you're referring to is also our experience. The question is how much within the Muslim community we identify with each other. How do we deal with the question of diversity within the Muslim community? And I think that has become a more conscious question more recently, and we are trying to deal with it. Can I just stress uh, one point, answering your question in terms of diversity? I think the more we stress the Muslim American identity, then the more we will naturally have diversity in our representation in our events, in our uh, presentations, in telling our story. So yes, I agree with you, we can do more in terms of having that diversity. And there are problems that we're dealing with internally uh, in terms of that, that issue. Where are we in terms of the civil rights progression? Um, I think we're still in the very early stages of that. We are not at the time of Martin Luther King, for Muslim Americans in general, all of Muslim Americans. Definitely African-American Muslims have, can contribute very positively to understanding where we should be in terms of getting our rights in, in American society. But I think as a Muslim American community, we're still in the thought stages. We're still in the stages of Marcus Garvey, for example, or W.E.V. Du Bois, or people that are developing the ideas for the Muslim American community. Um, and, and defining home as not where our ancestors came from, not where my grandparents lived, but where my grandchildren are going to be raised. I think that, in terms of the Muslim American identity, no matter what, where, what background we're from, is very important. And lastly, God wants us all to be thinking leaders, not blind followers. I think that's the message that's very important that we have to stress for the thinking Muslim, the common Muslim. All right, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask for really quick questions and then quicker answers. Um, go right here and then over here, and we'll kind of go back and forth. Thank you. Um, I was interested, I, I guess I have two questions. The first would be, what contemporary Muslim country, which operates under Sharia right now, 
would you point to as an example of the benign Sharia that was described here today? And the second part was, which moderate Muslim groups uh, spoke out uh, when the, it was discovered that texts at the Islamic Saudi Academy in Northern Virginia were talking about murdering Christians and Jews? Which were the specific people, of the specific moderate Muslims, who spoke out against that when the International Commission on Religious Freedom reported that? Okay. Thank you. Do you want to? I'd like to answer the first question uh, because it's very simple. Uh, our belief is that there is no Muslim country now that is following uh, Sharia law. And one good reason is because the very basics of the Islamic society, including uh, the election of the head of state legitimately by the people, is not taking place. Um, where do you go from there? So I'm not standing here to defend any Muslim country, and I hope that within the United States I can be a better Muslim than I can in some of these Muslim countries. You called it benign Sharia law. It's like, you know, what did we do to it or for it to make it benign? Uh, I don't like that terminology. Our laws are humanitarian laws, equitable laws, etc. There is no attempt to make them more or less benign. The only issue is whether they are applied or not applied. And in fact, there is no Muslim country that applies it. There are tons of Muslim countries that claim that they are applying it. And they're using this to oppress their people. They're trying to tell the people that they're there and their laws are by divine will, so to speak. Uh, and we need to tell these people that this is not true. And divine will would want the will of the people to speak out. Condemnations? Oh, you know, it goes back to the question, you know, do you want to validate the accusation? that Muslims don't speak out. And, and the fact is, we have spoken out at every instance. Um, and it gets ridiculous how many times things keep coming up, uh, to the point that we don't even know uh, the cases that come up, whether they are actually valid or not. And the commission that the gentleman uh, refers to, some of the commission leaders uh, have questionable um, uh, views uh, in terms of religious freedom of Muslims in America. Uh, there was a report on that. So I don't want to get into the politics of that commission or the politics of that, that academy, but when it comes to um, anyone saying that, that, that we should be murdering Christians and, and Jews, we condemn that, um, and we denounce any groups that uh, espouse those beliefs. Jim? This is one of those, uh, if I can quote the, the New Testament, uh, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, uh, stories. I, um, I condemned it. I'm not Muslim. I'm Christian. I run the Arab American Institute. I was actually on Crossfire when that story first came out. I was asked about it and I said it's gross, despicable, and wrong. Should should be stopped. When a couple of years later I was invited to Saudi Arabia to uh, by the US Ambassador Bob Jordan at the time who had not been able to have a guest or a visitor to the country in a period of time, long time, um, and wanted me to come and do a luncheon at the embassy and, and invite a number of Saudi uh, business leaders. And then he wanted me to speak to a number of groups around town. One of the groups he invited me to speak to was a group called Whammy, um, and it involves a lot of young Muslim leaders uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, the ambassador took me to the event, sat with me at the event. Uh, I was introduced, I spoke, and then they drove me back to the embassy when it was over. I got a question about uh, Pat Robertson and, and some other U.S. preachers preaching uh, hate uh, about Islam. And I said, uh, condemn it. And we work real hard every day to fight these guys. And we're working harder than you can imagine to deal with this bigotry uh, in America. I said, but let me remind you uh, that you have imams in this country who are saying things about Jews and Christians that are deplorable. Are you fighting them? Um, and uh, they all nodded guilty and whatever, and we had a conversation about it. Uh, a week later, I get back into the country, and one of these characters that I mentioned a moment ago writes an article about Zagbi, supporter of Wahhabism, speaks at Whammy. Um, <laughs> Didn't pay attention to the fact the ambassador invited me. Didn't know what I'd said, uh, and actually had become an article in the newspaper that I challenged them on the bigotry of some imams. 
the point is, is that uh, a lot of groups condemned that book when it was first released, and the Saudis did the job of getting rid of the book. It shouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, pay attention to what is done, what is said, and and I think we we do a lot better in this conversation if we if we did just that. Question over here. which I, as a Muslim, have trouble with, as if we have to add a word first before just saying Muslims in this country. And I would like your input on this, because unless you're not wearing a headscarf or unless you don't go to the mosque that, or unless you look cool, then you're a moderate Muslim. But if you're wearing a hijab or you go to the mosque or you're a practicing Muslim, then you don't qualify for that term. And the trouble with that is that we've seen some people in leadership position advocating that those are the people that we need to talk to, regardless if they were non-practicing Muslims or you know, not cool-looking Muslims. So I'd like to just hear your... Well, I'd like to approach this uh, label of modern Muslim in a different way, because I know my colleagues here will address your answer more to the point. But in Islam, there is nothing wrong with saying that somebody has uh, interpreted Islam in accordance with the society they live in. In fact, it is a required effort that Muslim scholars when they live in a society, say American or Euro European or Iraqi or whatever, that they look into the circumstances of their society and then explain the rules and, and, basic, you know, and the basic principles don't change, but the rules and the secondary laws in light of that society so that when they are used and applied, they cause positive results and not negative ones. Because the general rule in Islam is that God, the lawmaker, made these laws in public interest and not against the public interest. So yes, there are scholars here, including myself, who are looking at the American society and who are trying to understand Islamic laws within the context of our society. And that is very traditional approach and accepted approach for what we do. What you're talking about is something more political, uh, and I will let the others answer. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, first of all, the Quran says that it is God's will that you be a community of the middle way uh, of moderation. And that's directly out of the Quran. And the prophet also warned against any kind of extremism to the left or to the right, to stay in, in that middle way. So within our religion, of course, it promotes moderate thinking, progressive thinking. And it is a responsibility of Muslims now to apply that in whatever place and time they live in. Now, I agree with uh, Aziza that the, the term moderate Muslim has been highly politicized so that now moderate simply means a person who agrees with the status quo. So, you know, all Muslims are bad. Yeah, all Muslims are bad. Islam is evil. Yeah, Islam is evil. And then that is the moderate Muslim. So that the only people who are the moderate spokespeople are people who have left Islam. Uh, and there's a paradox in that. It's ridiculous that these, uh, these are people that are now the moderates, like Ayan Hershiadi, who's not a Muslim herself. But she is, you know, given the book tours and speaking everywhere. Uh, or people who support policies uh, of certain industries. So they support war, okay, that's a moderate Muslim. They support the policies of the state of Israel against Palestinians, then that's a moderate Muslim. So because that term has been uh, politicized and exploited, then that term moderate now doesn't really mean anything in our community, and I agree with you. It's, it's Muslim or mainstream Muslim. To be a Muslim means you're adhering to the principles of Islam. Uh, to promote uh, terrorism means you're a criminal. It's not even a question of whether you're a Muslim or not. Question here. Alongside with an increase in civic and political engagement from the Muslim American community, what should we expect from our elected officials? Like, what role should they play in this atmosphere of Islamophobia? They really should uh, stick to the values of the Constitution and <laughs> create harmony among the people and protect their rights and... And they should be responsible, and they are irresponsible these days. Uh, the way, uh, I, I, the, the Park 51 dispute, to the degree that it was a, um, a Manhattan fight, 
We'd seen it before over the Khalil Gibran Academy, which 